My name is Harry Miller. I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about the Battle of the Bulge, <clears throat> at least as far as I'm concerned with the Battle of the Bulge. I don't know any more than my part of it. My part of it was I went into the 740th Tank Battalion as a replacement in about November of 1944. The battalion was already stationed in the town of Neufchateau, Belgium, which is about 15 miles east of Liège. The battalion was sent to Europe, without, uh, to Central Europe, I should say, to France and Belgium without their tanks. They were told to turn them in uh, in, in England, which they did <clears throat> with the promise that they would get a new supply of tanks when they got to Belgium. Well, of course, they did not. And when the Battle of the Bulls started on the morning of December 16th, 1944, they at first thought that it was just a spoiling attack by the Germans. However, they later discovered or realized that on the 17th that the Germans were serious. And the Germans came in in three thrusts. The center thrust was the, was the main thrust. The north shoulder was where we were. The south shoulder at this tip is where uh, Bastogne is. The purpose of, of the shoulder coverage was to protect the Germans uh, right and left as they proceeded, they thought, to Liège and then on up into Antwerp to cut off the, between the British and the American troops. So on the 17th, the night of the 17th of December, they decided maybe they better do something about our battalion not having any tanks. So they told us the next day to go to the three uh, ordnance depots that were in our area and take anything we wanted. Well, of course, we were hoping that there would be new tanks there, but there were not. There were nothing but beat up tanks that had been already through their war. A lot of them were completely useless. So we found two uh, M4 Sherman tanks that we thought we could probably put parts together and make a good tank out of it. So we managed to get two Sherman tanks pre uh, prepared by taking parts off of others and putting them together on two good tanks. We also did the same thing with a M36 uh, tank destroyer. The M36 had a 90 millimeter gun on it, and of course the two M4 Shermans had 25 or 75 millimeter cannons. So after uh, this happened, while well, we got a few other vehicles too, I, I recall there were uh, uh, two or three uh, M7 uh, artillery uh, mechanized artillery vehicles, and we had a couple of M8 armored cars. And of course, the rest were jeeps and trucks. So anyway, we were ordered on the morning of the 19th of December. And that's strange because that's the today's date, 19th of December. And uh, we were told to go down to the train station, the railroad station in the town of Stumont. So on the way down, we we got we found out that the 30th Division infantrymen. We're, on, we're in both ditches on both sides of the road expecting an attack at any second by the 1st SS Panzer Division. So let me stop here and tell you about the 1st SS Panzer before I go any further. 1st SS Panzer Division was originally a battalion and they were the elite palace guard for Hitler. And he fell in love with the organization so he allowed them to sew a band around their wrist. Uh, on their uniform that said Adolf Hitler. They were very proud of this. And they, he formed them then later on as a full SS Panzer Division. Now Panzer is the same word as tank. So it's, it's the SS Panzer Division or the SS Tank Division. Now on their way into, into Belgium from Germany, the uh, SS Panzer uh, made a little stop in, a, in an area that we called Five Points and they committed a big crime. The crime was the Mamadi Massacre. 
Actually, Malmedy was a few miles away from the town where it actually happened, or the village where it actually happened. The village was Bonais, and we call it Five Points. I think probably because it was difficult to pronounce the word Bonais. So that after they did the Malmede massacre, in which they killed over uh, over ninety some American troops in an open field, they proceeded on. And we later caught up with them at the uh, Stumont train station, as I told you. On our approach to the train, the street, the, the road that the train station was located on, we uh, discovered that there was a long circ uh, curve going into the road. And this was very helpful to us because as we approached, we could go around slow and see what was coming before we pulled out onto the road. So our lead tank made the first turn down that road and they came face to face with the lead tank of the 1st SS Panzer Division. Our first tank fired and, and around ricocheted off the cobblestones and hit the bottom of the tank, uh, the lead tank of the SS. And of course the bottom of the tank is the lightest part of the tank with the thinnest armor <clears throat> and so it knocked the tank out. Our tank immediately tried to reload, but when they did, the round was stuck in the uh, breech. And the, as I told you, the tanks were all junk tanks, so there was no radios, and there weren't even any gun sights on the tank guns. But he tried to, tried to reload, and he couldn't because the round was stuck in the breech. So he motioned with his hands for the second t American tank to come up, and as he came up, he spotted the second German tank. He fired and knocked it out by hitting the, uh, 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 the gun matlet and, and it ricocheted down into the tank and knocked it out. The third vehicle was the M34 tank destroyer, which had the 90 millimeter gun. When he came around the curve, he fired at the third tank, third German tank, and put three rounds into it real quick and theoretically he knocked it out right there. So these tanks were, were skewered on the road and blocking any more German tanks from coming down that road. This made uh, the Germans a little unhappy, so they turned around and went back, or retreated. But we didn't, they didn't stop. They found another road going into the town, the main town itself of Stomont. The train station was about a mile away, a mile or two from the uh, town of Stumont. So they found another road going into Stumont and when they got there they had a, a, a short infantry battle with the 30th Infantry Division at a, uh, in the backyard of a home called the, the Brown House. Uh, they had a, quite a battle there and the rest of the uh, German force took over a, a, a small uh, hospital in the main part of the town of Stumont. And the, the hospital uh, sat up on a hill right in the center of town. And because it was up on the hill, it was difficult for our tanks to hit a, a, a German tank that was sitting up there. And we found out that there was some infantrymen that were trapped inside this hospital. So they could not get up to knock out this uh, Panther tank that was sitting up there. So what they did, they waited until nightfall and built a corduroy road up the hill so that they could get up there and closer to the Panther and knock it out. A corduroy road, I'm sure you know, is where they place uh, items up uh, on a road or in the ground so that the tanks could get traction. So. They worked all night for doing that, and early in the morning, the next morning, they went up on this, this uh, corduroy road, and as soon as they got up above, I guess the German crew was asleep or something, because they didn't hear or see the tanks, our tanks coming up the hill. So they, our tanks knocked out the uh, Panther tank sitting at the end of the hospital, and we uh, liberated the American 30th Division infantrymen that had been in that hospital hiding out until they could get out. So they were very happy to see us. 
Well, we also discovered that in the basement of this hospital, there were something like 90 to 100 uh, Belgian civilians down in the basement, shepherded there by a, a uh, Belgian priest, Catholic priest. And he had the job of keeping the, all of these people quiet in the basement of this hospital while this German tank sat outside the door waiting for somebody to try to get out and they could kill him. Well, fortunately that German, that uh, Belgian priest was lucky and he kept the people quiet just long enough to uh, get them, get rid of the Germans and they, we liberated them. And even today, uh, they, they teach their kids over in Belgium to walk up to a, a veteran and they'll shake their hand and they'll say, thank you for my liberation, thank you for my freedom. Uh, and even today they do that. This has passed on to generation to generation over the 76 years. Uh, I, I, when I think about that, I think uh, you'd never see this or hear of it in this country. But these people remember so that was the town of Stumont. Meanwhile, back in the chateau just outside of Stumont, our battalion commander has set up our assault gun platoon to fire on the town of Leglise with six assault guns or six 105 millimeter cannon plus another 155 long tom which he commandeered off a road that was trying to escape the Germans. And he stopped them and he said, you will come with me and assist us or you'll be court-martialed. Well, the lieutenant in charge of the gun said, well, we'll do what you say for some reason. And so he went with them and so he set up these assault guns behind the, the uh, chateau and commenced fire on the town of Leglise. There was a chapel there and of course we had to knock the top off the, off the chapel because... That's where the snipers and the artillery directors generally perch. So we knocked that off and, and destroyed just about all of the town. And we ran the Germans out of Leglise. And we found a, a, a lot of um, American fire, uh, infantrymen that had been captured by the Germans still in the town. So we liberated them. In the chapel in this town, if you're familiar with the book, uh, the Monuments Men, the, you'll see a story and some pictures about a wood-carved Madonna in this little chapel in Leglise. Well, during the war, the, the Belgians thought that the Germans just might try to take it, but it was a, a very old item that they had protected for years. And so they hid this from the Germans, and when the Monument Men came around, why they, they showed it to the Monument Men, and they were very happy to see it. It's still there. It's a very nice thing to see. So Leglise was free. Uh, Leglise, about that time, uh, the 82nd Airborne and the 101st came up online. They had been up in uh, Netherlands, in Holland, for the Market Gardens fiasco, if you recall that. And uh, after that battle was over, they sent them back to France to refit. So when the bulge started, they sent these two airborne divisions up from, from uh, France. Some of them didn't even have weapons. They, none of them, practically, none of them had any winter clothing. So these guys came up to us, and they were in pretty bad shape as far as equipment and clothing went. But we were assigned to them at that point, and uh, uh, of course, uh, we, our, ours being an independent ta uh, tank battalion, the uh, First Army could could send us anywhere they wanted us. And they thought that 82nd Airborne was going to need some tanks, so they turned us over to the 82nd. And that was a happy time for us because uh, the 82nd Airborne, in my estimation, and in fact our whole battalion felt the same way, the 82nd Airborne was the best fighting outfit. Now, I know there's probably an argument on that, but if they were, if you weren't with them, you wouldn't know it, but these guys were terrific. And so were we. I got, have to admit, we, we got along great with the 82nd, and they liked us. We got a nice letter from their commanding general at, at the end of the war thanking us and telling us that 
we were the best tank battalion they ever worked with. Coming from people that had gone all the way from North Africa to Sicily, Italy, Normandy, Holland, and now into the Battle of the Bulge, we took that as a pretty good compliment. So we joined the 82nd Airborne. Now this was just about a day or two before Christmas, as I recall. And then it started snowing. And I don't know whether you have seen uh, 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 this famous picture or not uh, in magazines or booklets or something, but here's a picture of one of our tanks and some of the 82nd Airborne infantrymen following along in the snow. That was one of our tanks. And look at the snow. Here's another picture of another scene. And it is one of our tanks. So you can see what kind of weather we were putting up with. So anyway, we went with the 82nd Airborne and started taking all the little villages from uh, that point, uh, La Glaze, all the way east to the west wall. Uh, we had a battle in every little village, and it was a real, a real battle in many cases. We were still fighting the 1st SS Panzer Division until we defeated them at, at the West Wall. We had the towns with, with names like uh, oh, uh, uh, Coo, C-O-O, -O, I think that's the cutest name. Uh, Coo and Petit Coo, and uh, we finally got into the town of St. Vith. St. Vith is named after St. Vitus, uh, which is also the name of the St. Vitus dance, if you're familiar with that. St. Vith was, Saint Vith was a, a real battle. It was a, 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 actually a bigger battle, according to historians, than, than uh, Bastogne was. Of course, the public relations people uh, made Bastogne a much more important thing than it, than, than this battle, but uh, that was because our our PR wasn't as good as the Third Army's. I mean, they had Patton after all, and uh, he was kind of a, a classy guy. I guess the, the news people like to follow him. It's too bad because the First Army did so much more than Third Army, uh, but that's that's what we believed anyway. So anyway, uh, going. Going across there, we came into uh, so many, so many things that were so disheartening and disturbing. Not only the weather was bad; it was all the snow, ice, uh, fog. You couldn't see ten feet in front of you. And when it wasn't that, when when that wasn't bad enough, well, then you would run into a, a pile, literally a pile of dead Belgians that the SS would just shoot down alongside of the road for no reason. They'd just be standing there watching the tanks go by and the Germans would pull a gun out and just shoot them down like dogs. And this happened so often that uh, we, 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 no longer, we no longer felt sorry for any of the SS. We, we, would, we would shoot them back down just as quick as we could get them. And uh, it really became a personal thing, I think, between the airborne and and uh, and and the SS. They they both hated each other, and we were having a lot of trouble with their infiltrations and that kind of thing, which we pretty well took care of by the by the time Christmas rolled around. Now people have asked many times, well, what did you do on Christmas Day? Well, you know, I can't tell you what we did on Christmas Day because. Uh, every day was the same, the same thing. One, one day after the other, it was fight, 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 push, 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 go from one village to the next, to the next, to the next. And I, I don't think anybody even realized that it was Christmas Day until somebody said, "Hey, did you know that today's Christmas or yesterday was Christmas?" Oh yeah. So what? You know, <laughs> it, it, it didn't mean a whole lot to us because everything was the same. It didn't matter what day it does to us because we had no calendars, had no radios that we could listen to any news. Uh, actually, we had uh, taken over, not we, but uh, the Army had taken over uh, Radio Luxembourg in Luxembourg City and uh, they could pass news 
flashes to to the troops too. However, we didn't have any radios that we could pick that, that kind of stuff up. All we had was our regular radios between tanks and between companies and, and the battalion headquarters. So that's the way we spent Christmas Day, pretty much like we spent every day. And that was kind of a kind of a quick run through on what we did on in the Battle of the Balls. It, it was strictly fight, 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 and push, push, push continually. Uh, it was it was a, a, a case of get the job done and get it done as fast as possible. There was one infantry division that was completely wiped out. I, I say completely. I'll say three quarters wiped out because it had. It had uh, three regiments, like all infantry divisions had during World War II, and uh, it had lost two regiments to, that had just plain uh, thrown their hands up and surrendered, which was a terrible thing to have to happen because it was a, a bad mark on that on the commanding officers of those of those units. So anyway, uh, I I like to end this up by saying one thing here, here here's a a thing that was I found in a magazine or someplace and it was it was written by SLA Marshall he was a general and he was the US Army historian for World War II and he pretty much tells the real story the way it was and and I'd like to quote if I may the battle began with fog and darkness the thin defending line was overwhelmed and broken under the weight of fire and metal. The Ardennes door lay open. The uniform ranks of the United States fought for this soil as if it had been their homeland. The civilians, unarmed, refused to abandon it in the face of the oncoming enemy. 76,890 Americans were killed or wounded <coughs> or were marked. <clears throat> missing. Seldom has more American blood been spilt in the course of a single battle. The number of Belgians who died or suffered wounds or great privation helping these friends from overseas cannot be known. Unquote. SLA Marshall, U.S. historian. Now I believe that pretty much tells it as just the way it was. And uh, General Eisenhower, he made a statement and I quote him, more than the constant threat of an imminent death, our men overcome all that the unbridled elements could inflict on them in the way of snow and ice and sleet, clammy fog and freezing rain, all the pain of arduous marches and sleepless night watches. They had given up their wives, their children, or set aside their hope of wives and children, overcome luxuries or poverty, fought down their inclinations to rest their bodies and play it safe to search out a hiding place. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the Battle of the Bulge. And I thank you very much for your time and your effort in watching me. And I'd like to show you a picture of myself at the end of the war. And that was me. Isn't it terrible what happens to people when they get old? Thank you very much. And I hope you have a good day.